So in this lecture, I won't be focusing on specific parties, that's for the presentation groups, but also for your own individual research. Um, instead, I'll be looking at the theoretical element underpinning populist radical right parties in Western Europe. Uh, what a populist radical right party is, in what context do they do well, who tends to vote for them, and then also to assess the claim of whether uh, right-wing populism is sweeping through Europe. Um, although the title of this lecture is, uh, is focused on Western Europe, we're defining Western in a very loose sense, pretty much all countries which were not Soviet-controlled during the Cold War. That includes countries that would also be known as perhaps Southern Europe, Portugal, Spain, Italy, or Northern Europe, Norway, etc. And the framework that we'll uh, be looking at, especially MUD's framework, applies across the globe. Okay? Uh, if a party meets those criteria, it can be called populist radical right, regardless of the fact uh, of whether it's in Western Europe or not. Okay, so who counts as populist radical right? Well, there are a few ways to measure it. This graph that I made uh, is taken from the POPA data set again. Um, and what it shows is on the kind of zero to 10 ideological left-right spectrum, and also on a scale of zero to 10 for populism, where parties that POPA classed as, popular, uh, as radical right are placed. Okay, now, because they are all tend to be pretty much in the top right quadrant, the graph axis is uh, is cropped. But this is the same graph that I showed in, in previous week's lecture. The two that stand out away from the kind of cluster in on the you know in the top right there are Zizi, which is not just an overpriced Italian restaurant chain, it's also the Croatian Human Shield Party. Now these are classed as radical right in the Popper data set, but as you can see here, they're placed firmly on the left uh, economically, but they are very populist. Their ideology is much more uh, what's, what's known as syncretic, i.e. it combines elements of left and right. So they are populist, they are Eurosceptic, but they're also economic protectionists, they're anti-globalist. Uh, they also kind of aim for left-wing goals such as free healthcare and education, but also argue for lower taxes as well. And so this is a kind of outlier case in, in the classification. And it also shows how different... Um, different data sets can label parties differently, right? Uh, and then you've got the SNS, which is the Slovak National Party. So this scores lower on the populism scale, but on the left-right axis is fairly right-wing. Um, and here it's been classed as radical right because of its national conservatism, its authoritarianism, its Euroscepticism, but it's less populist in the us-them divide because that's less based on morality and it's more based on ethnic identity. So in this case, the us is uh, ethnic Slovaks, and them are Hungarians, Roma, um, as well as immigrants more broadly. And although the, the articulation of these differences might be moral, um, the groups that are chosen to represent them are based on ethnic divides. And in, in this table, I've got um, all of the parties on the, on the graph listed, and the vote share in the last general election, last national election, uh, and that data comes from the Gov Paul, uh, sorry, Paul Gov data set. It, and it ordered, obviously, in, in, um, in size of vote share. So it's just a little bit of context for you. Uh, here's another table. I used this table for previous years. Um, so I thought I'd keep it in, even though there's a, a table on the previous slide. What this one shows, though, is the role of the electoral system in helping to translate vote shares into seats. So in places like... Uh, well, like the UK, although this isn't the best example here, like in France, um, populists don't do well in terms of turning their vote share into seat share. But pretty much everywhere that populists have done well, there is a PR system. Um, and that's because of the effective transfer of votes into seats. Again, uh, there's some footnotes to this and some useful websites in the uh, in the slide notes here, but this is just about setting the scene, setting the context. So, how important is right-wing populism in Europe? Well, this graph, um, or this this map, I guess, shows European national parliaments with representatives from right-wing populist parties in May 2019, and the different shades of blue represent uh, different. Uh, different roles. So at the lower end, we have the lighter blue where right wing populists are just represented in the parliament. Um, and that's pretty much everywhere except for places like Ireland, for instance. Um, 
right-wing populists who provide external support, so that is uh, the UK in May 2019, right, Theresa May's government, where the DUP provided support. And then we've got right-wing populists in government in a slightly darker blue, and then right-wing populists appoint the prime minister. Um, so we can see that, for example, in Poland. And again, this is just to show that, you know, right-wing populism is quite pervasive across Europe, but it's not necessarily everywhere. Okay, so let's get into how to define uh, populist radical right parties. So Zaslav argues that unlike traditional political parties such as communist, socialist, Christian democrats, radical, extreme and populist parties don't adhere to a single foundational doctrine, political philosopher, belief or intellectual tradition. And that's partly because of how they emerged, right? There's no one route to follow. The Progress Party in Norway began as an anti-tax party. The Northern League in Italy began as a regional political movement responding to kind of centre, periphery and north-south economic grievances. The MSI in Italy is a party with fascist roots and the Austrian Freedom Party and the Swiss People's Party were established political parties that were transformed by charismatic leaders into new populist radical right political parties. So parties can reach the point of being populist radical right by various means. So how do we classify them or how should we? Well, Ignazzi was one of the first scholars uh, to systematically examine this new wave of political parties, and he labelled them extreme right-wing parties. His analysis distinguished between two forms. Parties with direct links to interwar fascism, so for example the Italian MSI, and a kind of new post-industrial extreme right. The post-industrial extreme right differed from earlier versions of fascism, as well as neo-fascism, because... Fascism and neo-fascism are located at the extreme end of the political spectrum and they are anti-system political forces. Ideologically, though, the new post-industrial extreme right uh, represents a counter-post-materialist response to the so-called post-material revolution, which kind of fuses, or at least Ignazi argued, fuses neoliberalism with support for authoritarian values in opposition to post-material values, such as environmentalism, feminism, um, gay rights, things like that, um, and emphasises things like traditional family values and law and order and is anti-immigration. Paul Taggart and uh, Hans Georg Betz responded to and elaborated Ignazi's um, earlier claims, and they argued that new and radical right extreme parties needed to be contextualised within post-industrial society and transformations within the welfare state. But what Taggart and Betts did that was most important was introduce the concept of populism to understanding these parties. Taggart and Betts, each in their own manner, argued that successful right-wing parties, unlike traditional fascist or Nazi parties, were populist mobilising voter resentment towards political elites. And according to Taggart, populism constitutes uh, like a political ideology uh, in which the kind of authentic heartland is mobilised by charismatic leaders against political and economic elites. Okay, So the people of an authentic England or an authentic Britain or an authentic Poland uh, against elites who want to kind of erase that type of heritage. And then you've got MUD, uh, whose populist radical right parties in Europe basically provided the key definition for populist radical right parties. And he argued that we shouldn't lump together all right wing parties in with extreme right neo Nazi or neo fascist parties. And because actually there's a difference between extreme and radical, right? So where extreme right parties oppose democracy, you know and toto like across the board radical right parties or radical parties just challenge liberal democracy but they're not anti-constitutional and so we have mud party family uh, the populist radical right when assessing this party family mud proposed two definitions a minimal and a maximal definition the aim of the minimum definition or minimal definition is to describe the core features of the ideologies of all parties that are generally included in the party family. So feminism has gender, Marxism has class, liberalism has individual liberty. For Mudd, the key element of populist radical right thinking is the nation or nationalism. And this provides the coat hanger for other concepts too. 
So nationalism can be defined as a political doctrine that strives for the congruence of the cultural and the political unit, i.e. the nation and the state, respectively. In other words, the core goal of the nationalist is to achieve a monocultural state. Nationalism is often subdivided uh, by differences between ethnic and civic nationalism. So ethnic nationalism, uh, the national community is held together by pre-existing ethnic characteristics with nationhood defined by language, uh, religion, customs and tradition. And so in that sense, the nation creates the state or the people create the uh, the ethnic people create the governance structures, right? The nation creates the state. And then you have civic nationalism, where the national community is defined by a common citizenship and nationhood is defined by a kind of shared worldview or a shared identity that can be held by many different people. And in this sense, the state creates the nation. Um, and you see this kind of this being created with Britain, for example, where before the creation of Britain through the Acts of Union, you you had different national identities and there was a name for the state that already existed the new kind of united kingdom to create a new british national identity however uh, nationalism alone isn't enough to create a populist radical right party as shown by i don't know kind of the case of the smp populist radical right parties also employ a nativist ideological approach which combines xenophobia and nationalism it sees those people or elements from outside the nation as fundamentally threatening. Uh, the basis for defining non-nativeness can be diverse. So it can be ethnic, it can be racial, it can be religious, um, or it could just be cultural. But there will always be a cultural and an identity component to this. And the lectures on Central and Eastern Europe will also touch on this concept. So these states have uh, seen little in the way of inward migration, but we still see nativist tendencies, which populist radical right parties can pounce on. And we also see this nativism perhaps emerging in some parts of the SNP's coalition, especially on Twitter, uh, with this kind of idea of cybernats. Uh, and there's a kind of rise in anti-English sentiment because this, this xenophobia, is, is this nativist sentiment is feeding into the SNP's uh, nationalism. And it used to be the case that the SNP would kind of private, pride itself on being a civic national project that's quite open and inclusive, but that has been increasingly challenged by the behaviour uh, of some of their supporters online. So these things are fluid, is the point there. In terms of the maximal definition, Mudd proposes uh, three core ideological features, nativism, authoritarianism and populism. So we've covered nativism. And I suspect you have a good idea of what constitutes authoritarianism in a kind of psychological sense. We can define authoritarianism as the belief in a strictly ordered society in which infringements of authority are to be punished severely. So strong on law and order, traditional conceptions of social order um, and what Smith terms punitive conventional moralism. So it's not necessarily anti-democratic, right? It's not necessarily, well, it's not fascist. It's not overthrowing the state with a dictatorship. It's just the preference for a strictly ordered society uh, where deviations from the norm are discouraged or punished. So it's important to make like authoritarian types don't individuals who hold authoritarian values don't always necessarily defer to authority if they see that authority as being uh, illegitimate or stemming from corrupt elites. And then we have populism, uh, which we know what you know what populism is that we covered it in the in the first lecture. And so, if we have these three concepts of nativism, authoritarianism, and populism, then where does the radical come from? Well, for Mudd, it's defined as opposition to some key features of liberal democracy, most notably political pluralism and the constitutional protection of minorities. Um, but not the overthrow of democracy, right? Or not being completely anti-system. Okay, so it's radical in the sense that it challenges the liberal notion of liberal democracy, not the democracy notion, as extreme right-wing parties do. And right-wing here is not understood as an ideology that wants to shrink the state because elements of populist radical right ideology quite like welfare chauvinism, as we've seen, 
but it's more an approach to how you view ideology um, how you view inequality within society okay the left see inequalities as something to be overcome typically via the power of the state whereas the right sees inequalities as natural uh, and often desirable for a whole range of reasons including you know motivating individuals to do better to perform better to work harder um, and also inequalities as a result of the amount of work effort time people put into things right they, they see it as undesirable for someone who works 40 hours a week on a very hard very high rewarding job to be paid the same as someone who works 12 hours a week on an easy job that doesn't contribute much so inequalities are seen as natural and desirable for the right so what is the populist radical right party not that's a very chunky sentence if the populist radical right party um, is a party family then we should be able to define it against other party families that you can find on the political right um, and the first thing to understand is that there is a difference between a skepticism of multiculturalism and being an out and out opponent of multiculturalism so for example forza italia's berlusconi has been critical of islam because he sees it as a threat to liberal values. Similarly, um, Emmanuel Macron, who is not a populist radical right figure, has been critical of, um, again, of Islam and migration in some respects when there is a lack of uh, integration within French society. Okay, so amongst other right-wing party families, populist radical right parties differ from conservatives uh, because conservative ideology doesn't really have nativism, um, more more patriotism as a kind of um, core element. So this is, a, you know, if you think of these on a scale, pa patriotism is a much weaker form of nativism. OK, it's it's proud of a country, but it doesn't see membership of that political community in in strict terms. For conservatives, there might not be an opposition to immigration. There might be. Uh, and the nation might not be the key unit of analysis as it is for the populist radical right and then we have the new right for the new right nativism is not a core ideological feature of uh, new right thinking or of neoconservatives and although they do tend to be strong defenders of national state interests um, which kind of explains their propensity towards isolationism or euroscepticism um, this isn't often seen through ethnic um, or cultural divides it's actually just seen through security or economic uh, lenses and again the socio-economic agenda is secondary for populist radical right parties and most of them do not hold neoliberal views in certain areas such as welfare provision for natives whereas the new right is neoliberal and then we have ethno-regionalist parties and their views and, and the movement as a whole demands greater control over the affairs of the regional territory by people residing in that territory, usually by means of the installation of a regional government. And there's a clear distinction between nationalists, including populist radical right, and, and regionalists. So first, regionalists can accept a multinational state. And secondly, for regionalists, their call for autonomy is not necessarily culturally defined. So... Think again in the case of perhaps the SNP as a nationalist party. They want an independent country where the state reflects the nation. Regionalists just want greater power for, for an area for a range of reasons. It could be because they argue that actually it will achieve economically better outcomes, for example. So whilst all populist radical right parties are nationalist, only part of the nationalist parties are populist radical right. And so the populist radical right is a subfamily of a broader nationalist party family, if that is your unit of analysis. And the populist radical right are not necessarily the same as other populist parties on the right. So you can get right wing populists, right, as a term. And this is generally an umbrella term for any non egalitarian populist, right? Any populist party that is fine with inequalities. And it, the, the phrase right wing populist is journalistic. Um, and it's too imprecise to define a particular party family. You can also have neoliberal populists, um, and they have a core economic focus, not necessarily, and th their core concept is not nativist, right? 
if and if nativism does exist in their ideology it's not central so think of um uh, alberto fujimori in peru um as an example of a right-wing populist berlusconi again example of a right-wing populist who's not populist radical right um thatcher could be a, could be seen um to be a populist she would not be a populist radical right actor so mud argues that the populist radical right is a specific form of nationalism therefore whilst all populist radical rightists are nationalists not all nationalists are populist radical rightists non-xenophobic nationalists are excluded elitist nationalists are excluded the populist radical right is not fascist or nazi since the populist radical right is nominally democratic just not liberal democratic if this sounds confusing reading the chapters by mud will help Although uh, Mudd's definition has garnered widespread usage from across political science, it's not uncontested. So Zaslov argues that the minimum maximum definition articulated by Mudd leads to definitions that are too limited. And in the process, important ideological concepts are excluded, uh, namely economic factors. So in a chapter entitled, It's Not the Economy Stupid, Mudd claims that economic policies and economic concerns are not core issues for populist radical right parties or for their supporters. Culture trumps economics. Instead, however, Zaslov argues that despite the importance of cultural issues, such as immigration, multiculturalism and national identity, it is important not to disregard either the economic platform of the populist radical right or the link between economic grievances and support for the parties in question. The populist radical right typically supports a market economy, uh, while it demands state protections from international capital and international institutions. It does support the welfare state, albeit in a different form than the left. Mud notes, the populist radical right holds a relatively positive view of the market within the nation state, but regards the European and global markets with great suspicion. Also, the radical right, a populist radical right, calls for the protection of the welfare state at its present or previous high levels. But there are methodological or research consequences to this. Sasslov argues that Mudd's approach, the prioritisation of culture at the expense of the economic, is too reductionist. This is based on two assumptions. Uh, firstly, the perception of the salience of class, especially traditional class allegiances, is on the decline and the, the perceived incongruence between the working class and right-wing economic solutions. However, class it still is important, Zaslov argues, to the success of the populist radical right. Um, populist radical right political economy mitigates support for a market economy with populist justice. The idea that the state should protect individuals who are harmed by market forces, but only those who are part of the in-group. So, true to their right-wing roots, the populist justice ethos does not suggest an eradication of inequalities instead the critique of the welfare state is directed at left-wing conceptualizations based upon inclusion redistribution and leveling of differences between ethnic groups and classes the populist radical right on the other hand would like to see a welfare state that to put it in a kind of commonly used phrase looks after our own uh, epitomizes charity begins at home these type of values as a result of this understanding of a populist right political economy, it should start to become clear how these parties can be supported by voters from a range of different economic positions within society. Flecker et al. Uh, demonstrated that voters support the radical right for multitudes of reasons. Uh, three trends were identified. So first of all, supporters demonstrate intensive feelings of in injustice from frustrations of legitimate expectations relating to various aspects of work, employment, social status, or standard of living, i.e. they're not getting the kind of sense of positive self-identity that they, they might have expected from having a certain job or a certain role in the economy. Uh, there's a sense of fear and anxiety that comes from a sense of powerlessness, from economic decline, precarious employment, and the devaluation of skills and qualifications. And finally, those who had experienced occupational advancement with a strong sense of attachment to the company and its goals. So in other words, not only the losers of modernization support the radical right, but also the winners of, modern, of modernization, um, as well as those who feel dazed, confused and bewildered by existing socio-economic transformations and the seeming inability of political parties to respond adequately to absolute and relative levels of economic decline. Even Mudd noted 
that the populist radical right wins support from across different classes and socio-economic constituencies. Populist radical right parties and their supporters basically want to have their cake and they want to eat it too. They support reduction in taxation and deregulation whilst objecting to the dismantling of the welfare state. This is also country dependent. So in some countries, um, maybe for example, Spain and Germany, where the driver of support for populist radical right parties is much more about culture and traditional values and your skepticism, then the importance of economic concerns or class or industrial decline or whatever are less important. Whereas in countries, for example, in France, uh, Front National's vote is highly correlated to areas of economic decline. So it does depend on the country, on the context, on the issues, and on how the party articulates values. So how homogenous is the populist radical right? Um, Enser argues, if we examine the four main areas of identifying party families, so their origins and sociology, their transnational links, policy and ideology, and the party names, we should expect to see a greater variety in the types of parties that make up the radical right party than we do see. So origins and sociology. Uh, based on Lipset and Rockin's cleavage theory, uh, people who did Poly 239 last semester will be familiar with this. The origins and sociology approach focuses on the demand side of the political process, i.e. what drives what voters want and categorizes parties according to their roots in social conflicts. So for example, during the 19th and early 20th century, the major lines of division in European societies uh, became manifest in the kind of birth of political parties that represented social groups at either side of the respective cleavage. So you might have liberal traditional, you might have center periphery, you might have worker uh, owner as we had in the UK. If we think about one of the more recent cleavages, the post-materialist cleavage, we can see green parties emerging on the post-materialist side. On the contrasting side, we see the rise of radical right parties. However, when we look at the bases of party support, the radical right base varies. Although opposition to immigration is a constant, who votes for radical right parties has varied. And there is a difference between those who vote for radical right parties out of protest and those who vote for them out of ideology. There's also a variety in the origins of the emergence of radical right parties, as I said earlier. Whereas social democrats, for example, have their roots in the major social divide between workers and owners and originated from mass movements within the European working class, there's a much broader background uh, that explains the emergence of current populist radical right parties. Yeah. So using this approach suggests there will be differences between populist radical right parties in terms of ideology and traditional basis of support due to the differing backgrounds from which they emerged. We also have transnational links. So these can provide a useful first indication of which parties can be regarded as belonging together. Particularly in the European context, uh, the role of European parties and party groups in the European Parliament, for example, has been stressed as increasingly important. For Mayer and for Mudd, one of the strong points of this approach is that it follows the party's own choices. So, for example, if a party chooses to join the, I don't know, European Green Party, that shows that they do val they see themselves as a Green Party. Some international groups are not exclusively based on party families, and nor is their membership or ideology stable over time. E.g., the centrist Democrat International. But it's, it's a good way of using, um, of classifying parties on first glance, right, before you do any detailed research. So comparing the transnational federations across European party families, there are numerous failed attempts at cooperation amongst the radical right, which kind of stands out in contrast to the relatively durable organisations or Euro parties that have been established by other party families in the European Parliament. So in the previous European Parliament, we had uh, populist radical right parties sitting in three different groups. In the European Conservatives and Reformists, ECR, sits the Law and Justice of Poland, the Danish Folk Party, the Finns Party of Finland, the Latvian National Alliance. Whereas in the Europe of Freedom and Direct Democracy, EFDD, sit the Swedish Democrats, the Alternative for Deutschland, uh, the PTT of Lithuania. UKIP used to sit in the group, 
but the party under Batten left to join a more right-wing uh, Euro party, which was known as Europe of Nations of Freedom, ENF, and it, with them sit the Austrian FPO, the Flemish uh, Interest Party, the Northern League, the Party for Freedom, some UKIP members, and the National Rally or the Front National. You can look up now um, where various populist parties sit in the European Parliament. That's, that's up to you. Uh, outside the European Parliament, the radical right has been similarly unsuccessful in creating any sense of a European party. Um, the most visible attempt to date is Euronat, a federation initiated by Jean-Marie Le Pen. Still, Euronat failed to attract many of the most relevant radical right parties in Europe and has therefore led a rather shadowy existence. Similarly, recent attempts by Steve Bannon, uh, Trump's kind of former policy advisor, right-hand man, uh, was to set up a club, as he called it, called The Movement, to support right-wing populist parties, but phew, that's fizzled out uh, as well. We can also classify parties based on the ideology that we judge them to hold, based on research, manifesto analysis, things like that. But as we've seen, um, Mudd's definition, for example, is not the only game in town. We have critiques such as Zaslov, and there's other definitions, and as we know, other approaches to populism. So liberal parties, for instance, um, have been split between conservative liberalism and radicalism since the 19th century, um, and perhaps agrarian parties offer a third distinct group within the liberal family. Um, the major families such as conservatives, Christian Democrats, social Democrats and communists um, all have greater ideological coherence than liberals. And this shows that using ideological position can be difficult, especially if a party is only united by one common element, um, such as, for example, nativism, but in liberalism, individual rights, that doesn't necessarily lead on to a broad range of economic positions. So you can have a liberal party that is neoliberal. You can have a liberal party that is uh, socially liberal, such as the Lib Dems, where there's a much greater role for intervention in the economy because of how you view individual liberty do you see the role of the state uh, as to be as small as possible to give indiv individuals freedom from or do you see it as being kind of an enabling state to help people reach their full potential and also um, although we can try to use a common definition to class parties what we should note and what i think we've seen based on some of the graphs anyway, is that parties that are classed as, say, radical right might actually be placed very far apart on any kind of axis, things like that, okay? And if parties themselves have different policy priorities or have different concerns within their manifesto, measuring parties and their position becomes much harder. So, Mudd says, while there's, a rel there's, there's some largely undisputed cases of what counts as populist radical right, the Front National, the FPO in Austria, uh, Flemish interest. There's a fair number of borderline cases that are included in the party family by some authors, but left out by others. An example might be the DUP, which some say is a populist radical right party, others argue is a bit of a hardline Christian Democrat party. And then finally, we can look at party names. Um, party names and labels are important for communicating a party's goals, right? You know that if a party is called the Christian Democratic Party, it's probably going to be Christian Democratic. Similarly, if the party is called the Liberal Democrats, you can imagine they're going to want to do things like be liberal and reflect and respect referendum outcome. Well, anyway, Enser argues that for no party family is there less scholarly consensus about the labels those parties use and a greater discordance between labels than for the radical right. And partly this reflects the, um, the different routes that some parties follow to become populist radical right parties. We can also see this in the confusion around the types of labels that are given two parties that we in this module are considering as populist radical right. So you'll get hard right, extreme right, right wing populist, um, you're a skeptic populist, authoritarian, conservative, national conservative, populist authoritarians, authoritarian populism. Okay. Mudd identified 23 different names 
that has been given to the populist radical right party family. So to measure homogeneity, Ensel uses an expert survey to place parties from the Green, Social Democratic, as Liberal, Conservative slash Christian Democratic and the Radical Right Party families on six policy scales, tax and spend, social policy, EU authority, environment, decentralisation and immigration. When comparing the distance between parties within the same family on these six scales, the radical right is comparatively homogenous on the immigration, the EU and the environment dimensions, but rather diverse when it comes to economic and decentralisation policies. So compared to other party families, the radical right parties score lower standard deviations than both liberals and conservatives slash Christian Democrats on three dimensions. When averaging standard deviations across policy dimensions, the radical right parties turn out to be about as homogenous as centre right parties, but substantially more homogenous than liberals. However, when using more advanced cluster analysis, ENSA finds that the radical right party family ends up neatly in one subcluster, except for the relatively pro-European Norwegian Progress Party. The policy profile of radical right parties not only distinguishes them from other party families, but also characterises them as a party family of noticeable homogeneity, albeit less homogeneous than the Green Party family. Within the radical right group, however, there are some interesting subgroups. A group containing, amongst other things, those parties that display references to fascist heritage, most clearly distinguished by very moderate economic policies. A group of modern populist radical right prototypes can be found, including some of the most radical right parties. Uh, and these parties are strong advocates of decentralisation. And finally, in overlap with the centre-right, two subgroups of socially conservative and socially moderate parties emerge. In these subgroups, the boundaries to the Conservatives and Christian Democrats are most difficult to delineate. So, comparing Social Democrats with the radical right, the, distinct the, uh, the distinctiveness between the two party families is astounding, given the strong electoral competition between the two party families, especially for working class votes. Now, what we can gather from this is that actually on their core issues, so the EU, often parties are often radical right parties are Eurosceptic, um, but also on immigration, which you know we expect populist radical right parties to be closely knit on to all agree with, right? Because that's part of their nativist appeal. Same with with the Europe issue. Um, we see quite cohesive parties, right? Also on the environment, and this is partly because environmental concerns are part of this post-materialist value set. Um, the populist radical right parties have emerged in opposition to and then the other values are, are less important to the to the core ideology of the party and so we would expect to see more divergence um, for example in the same way that the greens are quite are, are tightly knit on their policy around the environment because they all agree because it's all part of the same issue so really the radical right party according to this analysis anyway is not more homogenous than other party families in Western Europe, although party families on the left tend to be more cohesive. Liberal parties are clearly a more diverse grouping than the radical right, and the conservative Christian Democrat party displays a degree of heterogeneity similar to that of the radical right. Um, I think what you should also take from this is that this is looking at radical right parties, not necessarily populist radical right parties. So we need to look at how these these party families are defined okay but i mean generally it's worth this this analysis is still worth reading because often the differences between radical right and populist radical right will be very small right and the parties that are included in the radical right grouping will tend to be the populist ones anyway so a lot of this section draws on the tripartite framework developed by mud this is on the reading list it is key for the presentations it's key for the module it's key for the essays and it's key for the exam at the end Please revise it. So firstly, Mudd says we need to look at the demand side. The demand side represents the ideal kind of perfect breeding ground for radical right parties. Uh, however, demand side is only one aspect of party politics. A demand for populist radical right politics does not necessarily result in its emergence or its success at the party level, the party system level. The demand side element essentially comes from voters, those who hold populist values and those who support the policies of populist radical right parties, or those who would support the party as a means of protest votes. Um, 
voting for populist radical right parties is largely motivated by ideological and pragmatic and programmatic considerations, just like voting for any other party. Similarly, radical right activists are typically socially integrated and appear, Mudd says, as perfectly normal people. The point here being that it, populist radical right parties are not some special subgroup that just emerge and need to be explained in any kind of special way, um, in the same way that we don't think the rise of a Green Party is particularly outrageous. Mudd is critical of the argument that modernisation theory has driven the rise of populist voting. So he argues, how do broad processes like this influence individual voting behaviour? It's an under-theorised area. Um, and he argues that globalisation uh, as the primary cause for driving the populist radical right is also questionable because he says why is this uneven why has globalization caused a rise in say france germany but not ireland or portugal although actually portugal is um, seeing a sudden rise in populist radical right support uh, at least in the polls but that kind of just goes to underline mud's point why has it taken why is portugal 30 years behind france when it comes to populist radical right support Spain, for example, only recently developed the populist radical right party, Vox. And so if we did expect globalization to be the primary cause, then across parties that uh, across countries that are similarly exposed to globalization, we should have seen a consummate increase in populist radical right parties. Also, why if if this is driven by the losers of globalization why is it that not all losers of globalization vote for populist radical right parties um, these ideas that we kind of see in the media that are quite unidimensional and that are quite prescriptive uh, often will explain one phenomenon why are certain areas voting for say ukip but then they don't explain why other areas that are fairly similar are isn't voting for ukip or you know, or why is Grimsby, Grimsby gone UKIP? Well, actually, how, how is it the case that if it's the losers of globalization, well, why is half a Kent voting for UKIP? All right. Further to this, it's hard to see how these broad stroke demand side factors account for fluctuations in party support. So if a party loses, a popular radical right party loses 5% of its vote in between two elections, that's not because the countries become 5% less left behind or 5% less globalized. Similarly, Spain didn't suddenly become 20% more globalized over the last five years for Vox to just burst onto the scene. It's also the case that these broader factors such as moments of crisis generate demand side factors for populist radical right parties is, is discounted to some extent because then we would have expected to have seen populist radical right parties emerge um, emerge from say the fall of communism um, the, the reunification of Germany um, and immediately after the Great Recession and so it's not just whether voters want it's not just these broad social forces that are creating demand from voters. Okay, as we'll see, parties themselves have to have to jump on opportunities that emerge, but also rival parties have to make mistakes or leave openings for the populist radical right to capitalize on. So Mudd argues that demand for populist radical right parties is a necessary but not a sufficient condition of populist radical right success. He also argues the same for the external supply side, and this can be thought of as the kind of political opportunity structures for the populist radical right. And again, these deter these facilitate rather than determine factors in the success and failure of populist radical right parties. So not why parties will gain support necessarily, but whether that support transforms into electoral breakthrough or persistence. So the institutional setup. Uh, plays a role. So, for example, up until recently, Spain had a PR system, proportional representation system, but no proportional, uh, but no populist radical right party. Whereas France has a majoritarian system, but a persistent populist radical right party. However, as we've seen in the earlier table, the voting system being proportional does make it easier for populist radical right parties and all other small parties to gain a foothold um, and then increase their vote share. Um, 
So, for example, in 2015, UKIP got 12% of the vote, um, but not uh, like one seat. Okay, in a PR system, they would have ended up with about uh, 72 seats. So the, the voting system does make a difference. Uh, the political level is important, the role of other parties. Um, if they move together ideologically, as arguably the main parties did when it came to the issue of European integration, um, and leave a gap in the market, then populist radical right parties can capitalise on this. It was only after the Brexit vote, when the Conservatives moved to, well, well when they accepted the Leave vote and moved to a pro-Brexit position um, as a matter of government policy, that UKIP was shut off. So, you know, what other parties do and how they react to populist parties is important. Then there's the cultural level. The stigmatisation of populist radical right parties can explain their failure to break through. Uh, we saw this also with the BNP. Um, and also the media has a role in normalising or ostracising parties and of structuring what we call the Overton window, which is basically the range of policies which are seen as acceptable or not. Um, in the way that, you know, perhaps nationalisation of key industries now is not seen as a serious policy in the UK, but it was in 1945, right? Because the Overton window has shifted. The Overton window has shifted on a range of issues, for example, uh, gay rights and gay marriage. And so where that window is positioned and what is a range of acceptable policies um, which is largely, well, not largely set back, but the media has a role in, in setting is important. And also the broader the broader cultural uh, zeitgeist. But for MUD, the most important factors are the internal supply side. Because the demand side and external supply side simply provide political actors with opportunities. A party can't really do nothing and expect to win votes. It is not a helpless victim of demand side and external supply side factors. Um, especially once a party has broken through and is established, populist radical right parties can make their own weather, as it were. So the literature distinguishes three key factors that help a populist radical right party become established. That is a moderate ideology, a charismatic leader and a well-structured organisation. So party ideology can explain some differences between populist radical right and extreme right parties, but not for electoral persistence nor diverging performances within populist radical right party families. For example, the Front National doing well, while Vox Spain only won, sorry, Vox in Spain only won 0.2% in 2016. Um, and again, what we needed there was for a new political cleavage to become salient in Spain, uh, that of uh, Catalonia separatism for Vox to capitalise on that. Mudd argues that charismatic leadership is important for breakthrough but not for persistence and instead the likelihood of electoral persistence is increased when the party organisation, the internal leadership and the party's propaganda are all on point. So once established once an established political party, party propaganda goes much further. Um, it will be, if a party's got seats, it will gain greater reach uh, in the media. It will be able to articulate its views more easily. It will get more airtime, more oxygen of publicity. Um, but really, Mudd argues, like any other party, persistence for populist radical right parties depends on having an effective party organisation, which is implemented well on a local level, and this requires internal party leadership. So external leadership is a charismatic leader who appeals to voters, which is important in breaking through. But what is also important is internal leadership that once you get members or voters, they're socialised into being loyal supporters by local parties. So you can't just have a Nigel Farage figure. You also need lots of Nigel Farages in each local branch, you know, something like that anyway. So. You can use, national leaders have a role in this, right? They can encourage local leaders in, they can keep them sweet and they can manage disagreement between them. 
But typically in populist radical right parties, you get egotistical, typically male, but not always, leaders who like to centralise power. And that often explains why many, and I'm thinking of the Forum for Democracy here in the Netherlands, kind of burst onto the scene, have a brief kind of honeymoon period and then crash again, because they don't embed in local constituencies or whatever on a kind of in a very convincing way. And they rely too much on the charisma of their leader, their national leader. And so for Eat Well, we should be able to distinguish between centripetal charisma and coterie charisma. Centripetal charisma is the ability of leaders to attract broad, broad swathes of support by becoming the kind of personalization of that party's politics. Um, and then you've got coterie charisma, which is the leader's appeal to an inner core, which is essentially the type of leadership any party wants. This coterie charisma can keep a party with strong subdivisions or factions together. So, for example, Marine Le Pen in the Front National. So essentially, parties and what parties do matter when trying to explain their success. Mudd argued that typically populist radical right or extreme right parties or support for those parties was only explained through the concept of the normal pathology thesis. This essentially views the rad uh, argues, sorry, that the radical right constitutes a pathology in post-war Western society, an illness, and its success can only be explained by extreme conditions, i.e. crisis. Authors working within this paradigm often consider the radical right in psychological terms and focus almost exclusively on the demand side of populist radical right politics. In this understanding, radicalism and extremism are taken to be the same thing, both of which oppose liberal democratic norms, values and systems. However, as we noted earlier, extreme and radical differ. Extremism is anti-democracy, whereas radicalism is just opposed to liberal democracy. So, for example, radicalism ex uh, is, in, is fine with procedural democracy, right? Elections and stuff like that. Extremism is not. The pathological normalcy approach takes support for far right, extreme right and radical right parties and actors as a pathology of a modern society. For example, Reich in, seven, in 1970 considered fascism to be the basic emotional attitude of the suppressed man and argued that in its purest form, fascism is the sum total of all irrational reactions to the average, uh, of the average human being. It's always psychological. As the, as the study of post-war radical right uh, parties was heavily influenced by the study of fascism, this approach continued. And so the normal pathology thesis holds that populist radical right values are alien to Western democratic values and that a small potential exists for them, uh, but sorry, a, a potential exists for them in all Western societies, around 10 to 15 percent of voters. Um, the argument went right. And these attitudes would only become politically relevant under extreme conditions. Now, this is important methodologically. In its most extreme form, scholars study the populist radical right unrelated to mainstream democratic politics. They don't use mainstream concepts and theories um, because they see populism or the populist radical right as something that can only be explained outside the normal. And they also then mean that the day-to-day -day role of other political parties is also seen as unimportant, right? If this is an illness with modern society, it doesn't matter what your centre-right or centre-left parties do, what issues they prioritise. Normal party politics happens over here, and populism and populist radical right politics happens over there. Now, the supply side is ignored, and this is all just basically seen as the outcry of repressed men. Right, Mudd argues there's two things wrong with this approach. Firstly, the ideological core of the populist radical right is not contrast to mainstream ideologies of Western democracy. That is nativism, authoritarianism and populism. And populist radical right arguments are not just shared by a small minority of the European public. Instead, Mudd argues that we should be talking about a pathological normalcy. That is essentially the idea that ideologically and attitudinally, the populist radical right constitutes a radicalization of mainstream views. Populist radical right views are held by elites and the mainstream, um, but usually in a more moderate form. So the difference between mainstream voters and populist radical right voters is one of degree, not kind. For example, when it comes to authoritarianism, the British public are quite keen on um, harsh sentences for a range of crimes, especially, you know, killing police officers, um, 
you know, sexual assault, sexual crimes, rape, um, murder, those type of things. They're also keen on life meaning life and quite keen on the death penalty, right? And that's a value that's shared amongst a sizable chunk of the population. So authoritarianism isn't some kind of radical departure. Most British people have some sort of distrust of the elite or they don't think that mainstream parties are talking to them or for them, blah, blah, blah. This distrust of the elite. And nativism, well, you know, most people have a preference for their own national identity, right? They feel solidarity or um, a sense of common bond with people from their own country more so than they do another country, right? So, for example, someone in Kent, in the south, will probably feel closer to someone from Newcastle in the north of England than they would do someone from, I don't know, the Netherlands or France, even though geographically the Netherlands and France are closer. But because of the shared national identity, we do have closer ties to people from our own country on the whole. So nativism might be a step further than that. Authoritarianism might be a step beyond what most or what a sizable chunk of the British population believe. But that, that's a difference of degree, not kind. So for populist radical right parties, the political struggle is not so much about attitudes, but about issues. After all, with regard to the issues that matter, the populist radical right trinity of corruption, immigration, security, the vast majority of most publics already share their position to a large extent. Within the pathological normalcy paradigm, the success and failures of populist radical right parties is first and foremost explained by the struggle over issue saliency and positions who can own the issues that matter. We saw this with UKIP, its success when it tied Euroscepticism to immigration because voters cared about immigration more than they cared about Euroscepticism. It's just normal party politics. Um, and the increased opportunities for electoral success for all populist radical right parties since the mid 1980s is partly explained by the opening up of political competition from beyond just a left right uh, battle between your kind of your center right party and your center left party with maybe a liberal party in the middle to a left right open closed or materialist post materialist party um, which opens up the space for political competition are in more dimensions and so where previously populist radical right parties might not have much of a position on the right because they're squeezed out by the large centre-right party now if the large centre-right party is say more post-materialist well there's a space on the centre-right post uh, centre-right materialist quadrant for the party and Again, these changes have happened over Western Europe broadly equally, right? These these cleavages have become more important. Um, and it's about how parties themselves position themselves on, on, on these policy axes. Um, so, for example, if a Christian democratic right wing party can own the issue of immigration, the space for a populist radical right party to emerge is restricted. Why is it that most populist radical right parties are Eurosceptic? Well, yeah, it ties in with their ideology, but it's also because that is where in European politics, the right wing space has been left open because most centre right parties are either soft Eurosceptic or in favour, especially say in Germany, of, of European integration. So what else can a populist radical right party do if it wants to win votes? So Mudd argues that parties which get the internal supply side element correct are more likely to be successful through a combination of leadership, organisation and propaganda, like the Front National, the Belgian Flamis Bloc, and also uh, UKIP for those few years in the early 2010s. Okay, so going on what I was saying about Euroscepticism, uh, are all populist radical right parties Eurosceptic? No, but most are. So we can see from populist here, we have 54 far right, well, what they call far right, far right populist Eurosceptic parties and only 17 far right Eurosceptic parties. So there's much more, uh, Euroscepticism is very common on the what, what, what we call a populist radical right, but what they've called the far right here. Um, and then we can also see that Euroscepticism is less common on the left. 
So there are, um, uh, at least on the populist far left, so you get far, 35 far left Eurosceptic parties, but if we include populism in the mix, we have only 17 far left populist parties. Um, and that is often because far left parties articulate their concerns in terms of class or something like that rather than in terms of a moral divide and they see the european union as a, as a banker's club for example um, we can also know that euroscepticism isn't a monolithic thing you can have hard and soft euroscepticism you can have hard euroscepticism which is more like euro rejectionism the idea you just want to leave the eu or soft euroscepticism is more about stopping further integration okay over uh, the next few slides there are just different breakdowns of demographics for um, each political party now this data is a bit dated it's from 2014 and but it's just to give you an idea of the different gender balances um, for example the different age profiles um, so for example when we come to age it is actually the case that you know leave and trump votes were much more concentrated amongst the elderly than the young whereas for support for le pen um was clustered around age 40 so and people who were age 60 were less likely to support le pen than people who were age 20. so that's something to bear in mind there is difference um i've also put class in there for you to look at to see the extent to which different parties do have different class-based systems uh, education economic situation uh, how attached people feel to Europe um, by different political parties and then also whether they feel their voice counts in the EU or not or in their own country and I've compared this so you'll see it's you know FPO and Austria FN France AFD Germany UK well, if you want to see any of this um, in more detail you can well, do do your own research for it um, but there is data out there that shows all this it's really easy to find And then finally, we will end on the reputational problem for the populist radical right and how that might be easing. So the graph on the left um, shows how the, if, so France uses a two round system to elect its president. Um, and we can see how in the first round, Le Pen basically keeps all of her support. This is from the previous French election. Um, I think it was in 2016 and Le Pen keeps all of her support but only gains a little bit of support from the centre-right Filon candidacy um, and a little bit of support from the cent uh, from the kind of populist left-wing candidate Mélenchon and so increases her vote share from um, from 21 percent to 34 percent in a um, from a five-part five-horse race to a two-horse race whereas Macron gets support from obviously the people who voted for Macron in the first round, and then gets support from Fillon, gets support from Melanchon, and also from Haman, which was the, the Social Democrat, or so, sorry, Socialist Party candidate. Be why? Well, because the Front National's reputation is toxic. However, we can see that now, well, actually, this is probably not like for like in terms of, um, in terms of what we're looking at, but we can see that actually Le Pen is placed first in the most recent French presidential election poll. This, and then there was talk that in the second round, Le Pen would win. So these reputational shields, uh, reputational issues, so that some parties face um, will, will can erode over time. And the parties, once again, are not just kind of passive victims. They can make their problems worse, e.g. by having a load of racist cranks in the party, or they can make their problems go away somewhat by taking a strong stance, by reaching out to people, by having 
um, people from different communities represented in their party. So, for example, one of the things that the Front National has done um, in making quite a strong anti-Islam pitch is to go to LGBT groups and go, look, you know, we've said some bad things about LGBT people in the past, but we've changed now. Do you think that LGBT rights are going to be protected if, and then they'll point to like kind of, if we've got loads of um, loads of immigrants coming with these kind of traditional Islamic values that are seen as bad for women and are seen as bad for LGBT voters. And they'll use those type of, um, the, the language of us v them to try and rehabilitate their own reputation amongst those voters. And actually, amongst the Front National, um, their vote amongst the LGBT community has increased, uh, especially amongst gay men. Um, and it is because they've articulated concerns over Islam that are shared by some members, especially in France's kind of ultra secularized political system. Anyway, gone on for far too long, so we will uh, stop there.